Welcome to the Improving Your Community's Homeless Outreach Efforts webinar. My name is Rachel Kenny, and I work with SAMHSA's Homeless and Housing Resource Network. Today's webinar will focus on outreach to individuals who are experiencing homelessness. We'd like to begin with a few logistical announcements. All participant lines are muted for the duration of the call. If you experience technical difficulties during the webinar, please email Kathleen Hess at khess at ahpnet.com. That's khess at ahpnet.com. We welcome questions and we'll have time for a Q&A session after the presentation. You may submit your questions at any time by typing them in the chat box in the online room. The presenters will respond to questions at the end of the presentation. Today's webinar is being recorded. Participants will be able to access the recording of this webinar along with the other webinar materials on SAMHSA's Homeless and Housing Resource Center website at homeless.samhsa.gov. Today's webinar will begin with introductory remarks from Keeson Thomas, the Program Director for the Projects for Assistance in Transition from Homelessness Program within the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. He will be followed by Jeff Olivet and Stephen Samra of the Homeless and Housing Resource Network, who will provide an overview of best practices and effective techniques for outreach. The presentation will be followed by a question and answer period. I would like now to turn this presentation over to Tyson Thomas, who will provide introductory remarks. Tyson? Thank you, Rachel. And uh, good morning for those who are on the West Coast, and uh, good afternoon for those who are on the East Coast. I would like to thank you for joining us for this webinar, which will provide an overview of best practices and specific strategies for effective outreach. This is an extremely important topic for homeless service providers everywhere, and it is our hope that you will benefit in a variety of ways from today's presentation. After this webinar, you may decide that your program should provide more outreach to individuals that are experiencing homelessness, uh, or your program may decide to redefine the way you do outreach, or it is time to incorporate some new outreach strategies or you may conclude all of these are relevant to your work. Whatever your takeaway message from the presentation today, we hope it challenges you to think differently about some of the aspects of your program's outreach to expand your effectiveness in reaching some of the most vulnerable individuals in our country. These are people who are experiencing homelessness with behavioral health disorders. We hope you find it a valuable use of your time. I like to now introduce the specific learning objectives of this webinar. Participants will be able to identify principles of and strategies for effective outreach, effective uh, best practices and safety practices for outreach work, and steps in building trust with clients. Rachel Kenny will now conduct a brief poll to help us learn more about the outreach work that you and your agency are doing. Rachel? Rachel, this is Jeff. I wonder if your phone is muted. Thank you, Jeff. I'm sorry about that all. And uh, thank you, Tyson. To participate in this poll, please indicate your responses on the screen to each of these questions, and it'll come up for you to indicate your response in a moment. So the first statement is, the statement that best describes my agency's street outreach services is, A, my agency provides street outreach services, B, my agency does not provide street outreach services, but we collaborate with other social service programs that do provide outreach. C, my agency does not provide street outreach services, and I'm not aware of any local efforts to provide street outreach. Or D, something else. Oh, 
Okay, Rachel, we have about 76 for A. We have 16 for B, 3% for C, and 6% for D. Great, thank you, Kathleen. So moving to the next question. My agency's street outreach practices, excuse me, street outreach services are effective. A for true, B for false, C for don't know, or D if your agency does not provide street outreach. Okay, Rachel, we have 63% true, 3% false, 11% I don't know, and 22% little number D. My agency does not provide a street outreach. Great. Well, that's pretty promising. The third one here is our outreach workers are trained in best practices for providing outreach services. A for true, B for false, C if you don't know, or D, if your agency does not have outreach workers. We have 56% for true, 12% for false, 16% for I don't know, and 15% for my agency does not have outreach workers. Great, thank you. And the last question here says, our outreach workers are trained in safety practices and feel safe when providing outreach services. A for true, B for false, C for I do not know, and D if your agency does not have outreach workers. We have 64, 65% for true, 12% for false, 8% for I don't know, and 15% for my agency does not have outreach workers. Thank you, Kathleen, and thank you, everyone, for participating. Uh, this concludes our poll. Thank you for your participation, and I would now like to turn the presentation over to our speakers, Jeff Olivet, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Center for Social Innovation, and Stephen Samra, who is the Deputy Project Director at the Center for Social Innovation. Stephen and Jeff? Rachel, thank you, and hello, everyone. It's great to be here today, and I want to thank SAMHSA for the opportunity to speak with everyone. I'm an associate, and I'm a deputy project director at the Center for Social Innovation, and I'm also a peer in long-term recovery from homelessness, addiction, and some mental health challenges. I lived for a number of years on the streets and in several homeless camps back in the late 90s, and I've been involved in providing street outreach since around 2005. Today I work with SAMHSA providing technical assistance and training to organizations all over the country, supporting them with promising and evidence-based practices and sharing my own experiences and tactics that I've found successful in both urban and rural settings. I serve as a commissioner on our local Nashville Metropolitan Homelessness Commission and advocate ending homelessness at every opportunity I get. I'm looking forward today to sharing with all of you and I hope you find something here that will help you with your own efforts to end homelessness in your community today. I'll turn this over now to Jeff for introductory remarks. And Stephen, you just look downright angelic in your image there on the screen. It's lovely. Thank you, Jeff. Um, uh, this is Jeff Olivet. I'm based in Boston. Uh, I've been involved with street outreach for about 22 years. I started in outreach work in about 1991, and it's been really amazing to watch the evolution of our nation's response to homelessness over the last couple of decades, and I really appreciate uh, your leadership and SAMHSA's leadership uh, around making outreach a priority. I think the signal there is that uh, the people who have slipped through the cracks of our system uh, deserve better. They deserve us to, to find them and connect with them, and build rapport, and um, bring them into housing and services and really uh, end homelessness for them. So I, I appreciate the, uh, the focus on outreach today, and I appreciate all of you 
on the webinar here for taking the time to complete the poll questions. It was really interesting to see the the range of experiences as uh, as Rachel and Kathleen talked through the the poll questions of you know how many of you are doing outreach, and yet um, how many of you still feel like there's more to be done, both in terms of quality and training and uh, the the work that you you feel like still needs to to happen around safety and around best practices and around really doing this crucially important work and doing it well. So I wanted to just start um, with uh, a little definition of the purpose of outreach. And the, you'll see a number of references uh, to various articles and training curricula. We've got all of those references and resources listed at the end of these slides. Our friend Ken Craigville in Seattle and others like Sam, Sam, Sam Samberas with Pathways to Housing uh, in New York City and Washington, D.C., and Erickson and Page and others have spent two decades building the literature around what outreach is, how it works, what the, the research shows to be the outcomes. And there's some consensus around the purpose of outreach, which is beyond bottles of water and clean socks. Uh, although meeting basic needs is critical, it's often only the starting point. It's the um, the way to connect with people and, and it meets a basic need. But outreach is also about building connections. It's about uh, connecting in a, in a very human way with people who are viewed by society as less than human. Uh, it's really about relationship. It's about uh, bringing people in for care and services, but it's also about providing services and supports where people are, whether it's down by the river or under a bridge or in a uh, in a camp or a, a, an alley, um, and, and it's it's really about taking, uh, instead of expecting people to come to our front doors, taking the front door to them. Uh, Ellen Bassick defines outreach as face-to-face -face interaction with people who have experienced homelessness. It can take place both out there in places like I talked about on the streets, in camps, under bridges, uh, and also in uh, service settings like shelters and meal sites and drop-in centers. Uh, we'll make a distinction in a little while between outreach and in-reach, um, but but I think you know the, the the common thread is taking services to where people are. Um, in, a, in a real active outreach process, uh, outreach workers seek out people uh, rather than waiting for them to come in for services. The distinction between outreach and in-reach is one that the PATH program uh, has made in recent years, um, defining in-reach as really connecting with people who are already uh, involved with services of some kind as compared to outreach, which is really the most effective way to engage people who are not at all connected with, with services currently. So uh, the emphasis in, in PATH over, over the last couple of years has really shifted away from in-reach in shelter settings and, and other service programs uh, to really taking the services out to the streets, to the um, to the camps, to the river riversides, um, to really where, wherever people are, and that's a, a real shift for a lot of people. And so, I would encourage you to, to conceive of outreach in that uh, in that more extreme way, perhaps that's really out where people are in uh, you know not necessarily just in shelters and meal sites, but really out there under a bridge uh, and, and in camps. The impact of outreach has been incredibly well documented. Uh, there's a body of research that shows uh, decreased homelessness. It shows significant improvements in housing, dramatic decreases in psychiatric hospitalization. Uh, outreach can result in reduced drug use and improved health and mental health um, outcomes. And that has just been consistent over the last two decades. The growing body of research, which we reviewed in 2010, consistently showed these common outcomes. So I think there's very little dispute that outreach works. I think what happens sometimes in funding circles and policy circles is that the, um, the volume of people seen on outreach sometimes raises questions for project administrators and funders. It is by definition a labor-intensive practice. And I think what we have to remember is this set of, of um, very human, uh, very deep outcomes that happen for people who are touched by outreach. And so uh, even though the, the sort of volume of contacts might not be what it would be in a, 
uh, in an inpatient setting in, in a psychiatric hospital or in a, uh, a community health center. Uh, even so, the outcomes that outreach can achieve are pretty profound and profound for people who have been uh, deeply disconnected from services otherwise. Uh, the outreach on communities more broadly is also dramatic. Uh, we think that outreach uh, lays the groundwork uh, for all kinds of impact that community can have. And uh, one of these uh, activities is the annual point in time counts that really document the number and nature of people experiencing homelessness uh, in America each year. And the outreach infrastructure that has developed over the last two or three decades has increasingly made those point in time counts more accurate, more detailed, and more relevant. And then uh, the US Census, which occurs you know, obviously once a decade, is a less precise count. But your outreach efforts can inform that process, which then drives all sorts of other things, from representation in Washington, DC, uh, to a state's uh, pro rata share of various uh, funding streams, or the size of block grants that states get to address mental health and addictions. Um, so these are all critical aspects of outreach, even though they're, I think, one step removed from the kind of day-to-day -day human contact experience that outreach workers have. Stephen? Jeff, thanks. And I, I want to talk a little bit more about why the census is so important. It's, it's important because so many federal programs are really designed to benefit low-income populations and people experiencing homelessness. Now, these programs use the census data to determine community funding. Many of these programs are designed to foster local collaborations and encourage the best utilization of resources in order to benefit SAMHSA's target populations. The HUD's mandatory point in time account for people who are unsheltered helps establish the infrastructure for accurate census counts. And it helps identify strategies and key points in areas that pose the greatest challenges to census workers. The better your structure and planning is for the point in time counts, the more helpful it will be for those performing the census count. And the more frequent the point in time counts are performed, the better your data and your ability to compare and contrast what those numbers are and why there may be some differences. Next slide, please, Jeff. So I want to talk a minute for, about using and training volunteers. Uh, doing a good point in time count means good leadership, and it also means really good infrastructure. There are some very effective strategies for ensuring that the count captures the greatest numbers of people experiencing homelessness. It begins with solid training sessions. Creating and utilizing notebooks for training and for team leaders helps from year to year as tips and strategies that get added to those who are on the ground doing the count. Organizers of the count need to be sure to advertise the call for volunteers widely and throughout your community. One of the local strategies I've seen in my area is to begin raising awareness about the count and actually soliciting volunteers during the holiday season through public service announcements. Good follow-up with information about the point in time count and the training is important, and you've got to ensure that the contact information is accurate. Practice sessions are highly recommended, and creating space for folks who want to practice some role playing is really important, especially for beginners. Now, you want to use police, but you want to use them judiciously. And this is really going to depend heavily on community relationships and, frankly, on the perceptions of the police participation by those on the streets. Because if, if there's a sense that police sweeps will follow the point in time count, and that's happened at times, uh, savvy folks will just leave the area until they know the count is over. Whenever possible, it's really important, at least for me, um, to recruit peers who are homeless or formerly homeless and pair them with volunteers and outreach workers. And I know that this has been a really effective strategy. Also, actively recruit military veterans and veterans of previous uh, point in time counts, because their knowledge and their experience will improve your outcomes, because they know where to look more closely than those who have never spent a night on the, on the, on the street. And finally, be sure to debrief your volunteers after the count is done. Tell them the results. And you want to, you want to broadcast that to the entire community. This can be done by email. Just make sure you let people know what you discovered during your count. It brings a sense of satisfaction that you were able to accomplish something. Now, finally, it's, it's probably really important to think about investigating the resources that you can, you can give out to people when you're, when you're actually doing the count. Food and clothing, bus passes, toiletries, leftovers from VA stand-downs, Project Homeless Connect events, 
uh, all of those have have um, surplus material usually at, at the end. Now, this stuff can include things like sleeping bags, blankets, outdoor supplies like boots, socks, gloves, camp stoves, duct tape, all kinds of things that folks can use. Uh, it's also important to establish sites where folks can also come to for the count, and in that process, maybe pick up some food, grab some clothes, and maybe, and maybe even check in at some available services. The key here is to plan, and then plan some more, and then use your well-trained people paired with peers and seasoned outreach, outreach workers whenever possible on the day of the count. Next slide. Performing outreach requires particular skill sets and really an understanding of, process, of the process of outreach itself. Now, this process includes locating those who would otherwise not be served by the resources available in the community. And I think this touches on um, kind of the, the difference between outreach and inreach. Engaging them into a trusting relationship that is person-centered and trauma-informed. Screening them for housing placement and other service needs, as, as might be indicated. Assessing their health and their behavioral health needs. Providing them with direct care and services as resources and opportunities permit. And finally, referring them to housing, health, and behavioral health treatment resources. For many providing outreach, there's often very little progress beyond locating, engaging, and assessing the person. And this is due to a whole host of reasons, including client reluctance, a kind of a distrust of the system, a lack of treatment and housing resources, and previous experience with the person with service deliverers that made them feel unwelcome or treated them badly. It's important for outreach specialists to recognize and understand this process and be careful not to drift too far into case management. This is one of the reasons I'm such a fan of housing-focused outreach and housing-first programs. They really help in curtailing this drift. There's a, a lot smaller amount of prep involved in getting someone into a housing-first unit than into housing following the other kind of housing readiness models. This is just another reason we, as outreach providers, need to remain focused on the ultimate goal of outreach, to provide housing and advocate for that goal whenever we can. Next slide. More and more cities are trying to coordinate their approaches for service delivery to people experiencing homelessness, including the no wrong door approach. And that allows them access into the service delivery system no matter where a person enters and working to maximize the scarce resources by avoiding duplication of services. To achieve this, teams of providers are joining forces. Now, I want you to think for a minute, is it, is it feasible to do effective outreach by yourself as an individual, or do you think it's more effective to be part of a team in partnership with others? Well, let me provide a couple of quick examples that might help you decide. The first example is a real simple collaboration that I created with police in Nashville, Tennessee, and it turned out to be pretty effective in strengthening the interactions and collaboration between police those experiencing homelessness in our local service delivery organizations. I partnered with an officer and created a simple one-page flowchart that an officer could refer to when engaging a person on the street. By asking the individual specific questions as the officer progressed through the flowchart, referrals could be made directly to the key contacts in a variety of agencies in our city because the flowchart listed the names and the contact numbers of outreach specialists and case managers who could quickly follow up with individuals based on the response the officer received. It was simple, but it dramatically changed the way police in our city were able to provide social services without having to invest any more time than they already did in the ordinary interaction with the person. And they were now capable of referring people directly to a wide variety of agencies that previously rarely had any interaction at all with officers. A more sophisticated example of coordinated team approaches is happening in the eastern panhandle of West Virginia, and it encompasses three counties. Here, a health collaborative hosted by the local Department of Health and Human Resources brings together local service delivery organizations into quarterly work groups that meet to address the challenges and develop strategies to help end homelessness. And they, they also address other pressing social needs in the community as well. Not only is this collaborative helping those who meet the requirements for many services, they also pool the money they get from funding, fundraising, TANF, local churches, the United Way, and private donors, and they use this for when a person isn't eligible for public benefits. Eligible persons 
can access the Community Connections Fund, and it helps pay for those who don't qualify for traditional services. This coordinated team approach was created because committed people got together and they figured out how to overcome the barriers. Some neighbor, member agencies working with those experiencing homelessness are also using HMIS data to enhance and facilitate housing and service delivery. Now, there are plenty of other examples of coordinated team approaches available, and SAMHSA is really trying to highlight these kinds of partnerships whenever possible as well. In your area, some of the potential partnerships to investigate might include some of the following. For health and behavioral health services, explore possibilities with federally qualified health centers, with ACT teams, hospitals, community clinics, community behavioral health agencies. If it's social services, check out the Department of Social Service, private agencies that support it, community action agencies, community ministries that are comprised of multiple denominations. For housing agencies, check out the public housing authority, private landlords, subsidized housing programs, and HUD permanent supportive housing programs. And finally, for, for homeless services, consider the local shelters, transitional housing providers, faith-based programs, safe havens, Oxford houses, and other sober living houses. Now, there's some general services out there, too, that you should be aware of. You want to check out food pantries, soup kitchens, legal services, churches, downtown partnerships, and neighborhood associations. I can only share suggestions here. You really are the expert in your area. You have to work with others to compile what is available in that community. And if you haven't already, you need to. And you need to start brainstorming with others in your community to start exploring what might work. The key here is really to identify, explore, pursue, and commit to building coordinated team approaches. Next slide, please. So we've talked about the processes for outreach. Let's talk a moment about some of the principles involved with effective outreach. We want to meet people where they are, geographically, emotionally, and physically. And we want to make sure that we do this in a trauma-informed, person-centered way. Whenever possible, we want to try and meet the basic needs and always remembering, too, that the ultimate goal of outreach is to provide housing in order to end homelessness. Many of our brothers and sisters on the street have been ignored and mistreated. Please, be respectful and treat them with dignity. And recognize that the relationship is central to outreach and engage, engagement. Relationships must be developed and they've got to be nurtured. And finally, you want to create a safe, open, friendly space, regardless of the setting. Remember that often, you are entering a person's home when you approach them. Now, when I was struggling on the street a decade ago with my own homelessness, it was rare to find anyone who did any of these things. And most of the time, I was forced to go to places that didn't feel inviting or safe at all. And I had to meet with people who often thought they knew what was best for me. And then they refused to listen to much of what I was telling them. I will tell you now, the thought of having to deal with most of the people assigned to help me back then caused me so much anxiety that I'd usually end up using before I visited their offices. And then this, of course, caused them to think of me as both noncompliant and actively using substances, both of which really impacted my ability to get the help I really needed. We can do better, and these simple principles will make sure that we do. Next slide, Jeff. So good outreach means anticipating and preparing for challenges. Rural and urban outreach each have some unique challenges specific to them. With rural outreach, there's a lot of ground to cover, and it is costly in terms of fuel, time, and staff time. Engagements can be less frequent, so reporting numbers are often lower. And there's only so much ground one or two outreach workers can cover in a day. And sometimes, just getting to a promising location can burn up a good portion of the work day. It can also be extraordinarily hard to find people in rural areas. People can be doubled up, making them very hard to detect. There is often very little infrastructure in place in the community. And the cost of all this uses up even more already scarce resources that are available for the task. With that said, it's not impossible to do rural outreach. You just have to use every resource you can think of. And really, to do that, you can't be cheesy about who you're working with. And you can't really exclude anyone from that effort either. I work for the campground in rural Tennessee that provides free campsites to veterans and to families who are homeless but who have the necessary items to camp with. 
And they also have some partnerships, this, this um, campground, they have some partnerships with a local hardware store and a county market uh, that will help folks who, who might have some need. Uh, the campground gets referrals from local churches and then it uses people in businesses in the community to direct folks in need to them. And they are extremely low key about what they're doing. To do outreach in this camp, I have to be very careful not to out the status of the campers, and all my referrals involve sending folks into service organizations rather than having people come to the campground. This protects uh, the whole campground, and especially the people in it, from stigma. It keeps the campground from being overutilized, and it allows the people there to maintain a sense of dignity and autonomy as they really try to hunt out some resources. I'm going to reiterate here that you can't be choosy or exclude anyone that might be able to help you find people in trouble. Local stores can give you a call and let you know when someone comes in who can't pay for their food or tries to run a tab. Churches can refer folks to you who come in for free giveaways, meals, or food pantries. And they will if they know you'll respond and you can actually help. Half the battle is making people aware that there are resources that can be accessed. And the other half is convincing people to contact you when they notice folks who look like they might be in trouble in their community. Next slide. Now, urban areas come with their own sets of challenges, but I think we're in a little bit better shape to mitigate some of them. More and more, communities are realizing that no single agency or approach is going to be able to address the complexities involved with homelessness. We can talk about some strategies on how to provide the outreach better. And there are some great resources available at the end of this webinar that may be really useful, like the Curriculum for Outreach and Engagement developed by Ken Cradle. But in the end, those of you on the ground every day in your communities, you are the experts. You know the organizations delivering the services. You know where people are gathering. And you should also know the various non-traditional resources that are in your areas as well. One of the most important things you can do to begin overcoming the challenges is to begin collaborating with everyone who delivers services and working together in coordinated teams where everybody is working towards the same goals, using HMIS data whenever it's available to avoid duplication of services, and then really kind of drilling down to the most vulnerable people on your streets. In Nashville, we just completed a 100,000 homes campaign this September called How's Nashville? And in that 100 days, partnering with almost every service deliverer in our area, and it, this included the VA uh, and our local housing authority. We were able to house and provide wraparound support for 172 people. Up to that point, we'd been averaging around 16 people a month. The use of coordinated teams provided clear and compelling improvements that cannot be argued with. There's one final point here I'd like to make. Using peers who are either homeless or formerly homeless on your outreach team or as advisors to those teams can quickly and effectively facilitate engagements, and it can help locate individuals in camps that you'd never find on your own. You just wouldn't. And they also know about hidden services that remain below the radar to limit the number of people served. Whenever possible, hire, partner with, and listen to the information they provide you, since they know firsthand what is going on in their community. I'll turn this back over to Jeff here. Thanks, Stephen. I just want to comment a little bit on the last uh, two or three slides that you've talked through. Um, it, you know, outreach looks very different in different communities. It looks very different if you're in, you know, one of the very large cities in the country versus uh, in, in a rural area or in a suburban area. I think what's critical is that there are some commonalities across uh, outreach, regardless of setting, regardless of uh, exactly um, what services are available and things like that. And you know, one of those is this basic principle of, of dignity and respect that Stephen talked about a few minutes ago. Um, and, and to me, it's, it has to do with recognizing people as full and complete human beings, uh, as opposed to seeing them through the uh, lens of their diagnosis or their label or their years homeless. Uh, it really is about kind of recognizing that, that everyone you come in contact with is a complicated multifaceted human being with a lot of joy and a lot of pain, with a lot of loss and sadness and isolation, but also with a lot of hope and a lot of love and a lot of dreams. Um, and so I think to me that's one starting point. Another starting point 
is this notion of creating a safe space for people, which I don't think requires uh, a fancy office. I mean, certainly you can take your service setting, your drop-in center, your FQHC, your community mental health center, and make it safe and welcoming. But you can also create that kind of space of hospitality uh, on a street corner. You can create it uh, in a camp out in the woods. You can you can create a sense of emotional safety, of um, connection and trust. Uh, and it really it does have to do not with a set of skills that you're using, but kind of who you are as an outreach worker and, and how you view other people. And in, in my mind, there's no us and them. There's no kind of the homeless and the not homeless. It really is um, a housing situation. It's that this person I'm seeing this afternoon on outreach or at six o'clock in the morning as they're uh, you know rousing up uh, from from sleep. It's that um, I'm just like them. They're just like me. And and one way to bridge that fairly immediately is a point that Stephen made earlier around the point in time counts have peers involved, have people on your outreach teams who have experienced homelessness. Uh, it's transformative to a team, and it's transformative uh, to how you go about doing your work. Another of the commonalities, I think, if we look across communities around the country and, and even across the world, is the best outreach is done by the best outreach workers. And I'd like you to just take a moment and think about the best outreach workers that you've known. If you're a supervisor or a program manager or an administrator, think about your real rock stars on your staff. Um, if you're a young outreach worker, think about the people you're learning from every day, your mentors, your guides, your teachers. Uh, if you're a seasoned veteran and you've seen lots of folks come and go, um, think about the ones who have been most effective. And I think there are a lot of um, adjectives we could use to, to talk about who they are as human beings, or the, the skills or attitudes or behaviors they exhibit. Um, here are a few that Stephen and I came up with. One, the, the most effective outreach workers we've known are never centered on the team or the agency or their policies or the referrals they're going to make or anything like that. They're, they're really centered on the person in front of them um, and understanding their situation having deep empathy and compassion for what that person has gone through, um, and, and really, in the most profound way possible, meet people where they are, um, understand what their priorities are, rather than imposing our priorities on them. Um, and that, I think that process of connection and, and being centered fully on the person in front of you is the starting point for whatever else that might happen. Another commonality across good outreach workers is the, the understanding of trauma and how to be trauma-informed. And one very brief way to think about that is seeing things through the lens of trauma, understanding that many, many people who become homeless have experienced unimaginable trauma prior to their homelessness, uh, histories of childhood sexual abuse, physical abuse, violence in their communities, uh, all sorts of horrific things, even even before they became homeless. And then we know for a fact that the experience of homelessness itself is traumatic. And it's sort of a wonder anybody survives the, the, um, the trauma of life on the street and comes out uh, the other side whole and healthy. Um, and Stephen, I think, you know, I really appreciate your openness about your own experiences. Um, your life and example, I think, are a uh, witness uh, to the, the power of survival and hope and inner strength and um, kind of what you've been able to accomplish has just been extraordinary and the fact that you're here talking about it so eloquently is a beautiful thing. So we understand that people have experienced trauma and we respond to it well. Uh, part of that involves training on becoming trauma informed which I would highly recommend for any of you um, who are uh, responsible for bringing training into your communities, into your organizations, get training on trauma. It's going to make your folks better outreach workers. Another area that I think requires not just training, but ongoing clinical supervision and support and practice and honing skills is motivational interviewing. And when I was an outreach worker, I think I'd been working on the street probably six or eight years uh, before I was exposed to this practice of motivational interviewing. 
I was living in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I was working at the Healthcare for the Homeless Project there. We had we were a path provider also, and um, co collaborated with community with uh, a lot of community organizations. And I was out on the street daily uh, doing outreach, and uh, you know doing doing as as best a job as I could. But I was exposed to motivational interviewing in the late '90s, and it was absolutely transformative for me. It changed every interaction I had. It made me a better, more effective outreach worker. It sped along the process of engagement and, and connection in, in services. I'm sure um, the, the skill that my team and I were able to develop in motivational interviewing um, helped, the, the, helped many, many people in their journey and in their process of recovery and reconnection. Uh, motivational interviewing, in a nutshell, is um, a way of being with people that's really grounded in um, meeting them where they are and walking beside them through a process of change. Now, it's a lot more complex than that and a lot more multifaceted than that, but involves asking uh, well-crafted open questions. It has to do with affirming people in the strengths that they do have and in the, the victories they achieve, however big or small. It has to do with really good reflective listening. Um, helping people hear their own words and reflect back to them what we're hearing from them. Uh, and it, it involves kind of summarizing what we're hearing and, and helping people, I think, move more quickly and more confidently along the continuum of change. And so if, you, if you've not been around MI, if you've not been trained in it, I, would, I, I just can't recommend it highly enough. It's, it's a, a transformative set of skills. And then I think the other things that are, are really common about effective outreach workers is that they're deeply collaborative and that they're encyclopedic in their knowledge of what is available in their communities. And not only are they doing that from uh, old information they learned 10 years ago when they started an outreach, but they're constantly out there learning about new, um, new resources in the community, learning about requirements for um, a new housing program or you know, building connection with other community providers so that the people they're working with on the street can get the best possible care that's out there. There are a number of characteristics that we've identified um, in, the, in the literature and in uh, the practice of outreach over the years. Outreach workers at their best are flexible, non-judgmental, they're independent, they're kind of low-key and relaxed, they're patient, they're resourceful, they, they have a great deal of tact, they're alert to all of the dangers and, and um, risks that might be around them and people they serve. They're assertive when they need to be. Um, they're clear, they're calm and unflappable. Uh, they're centered and they're focused on really not just trying to connect with people and build rapport, but they're focused on their role in the process of ending homelessness one person at a time. Some of the things we've learned over the years um, about how to do effective outreach, uh, first and foremost, be yourself. I don't think there is a a particular, despite these, these kind of characteristics that I just talked about, there's not a particular way of doing outreach that's necessarily the best way. I think the best way is to do your thing and do it well and to be comfortable in your own skin. Listen more than you talk. I talked about motivational interviewing already. Um, responding rather than reacting. Don't be hot-headed. Don't be reactive. Uh, be a little bit chill. Be a little bit... Um, uh, relaxed about it, but respond well to the, the environment around you. Uh, dress for the street. You can take that in all kinds of ways. That can be dress for the weather. It can be uh, dressed so that you're um, not building an unnecessary barrier between you and the people that you serve. Uh, for some communities, that means wearing identifiable t-shirts uh, or sweatshirts or something. For other people, it means not wearing any, any identifying uh, gear. So I think you kind of figure that out. Uh, in your own community and, and with the people you serve. And then finally, be culturally competent and work at it. Work to understand the cultural context from which people are coming and train yourself and your coworkers to be as, as competent in dealing with, with people's cultural context as you can. Um, Stephen, would you add anything to that list of the do's of effective outreach? I think you pretty well covered it, Jeff. So here are some don'ts then. Um, don't invade people's space. Uh, keep a, both a, you know, a safe distance, but also a respectful distance. Um, remember that you're walking in people's home. 
uh, they, they don't have a home right now, and that little bit of concrete under the bridge is their turf, it's their space, it's their um, safe space in some cases, and, and we're um, coming into that as a guest, and I think be sensitive about that. Don't overpromise, and certainly don't promise what you can't deliver on. Um, I think Stephen already hit on this pretty well, but don't case manage, um, and, and certainly don't view the people that you serve as a case to be managed. Um, in my experience, outreach in pairs is the ideal. Uh, sometimes it can be more people than that, but um, don't don't go alone. I think it uh, it's really uh, both a safety issue and a, and a connection issue. That sometimes you, you it's uh, better just to bring more heads now. I know that some of you out there, particularly in very under-resourced communities, find yourself in the um, situation of having to go alone. It's all you have the resources for. Where you can pair, pair up with, a, with another outreach worker, even if it's joint uh, outreach with another agency, um, where you can't at least be, uh, you know, have safety plans. Let your supervisor know where you are. Carry a cell phone at all times. Uh, be smart about it. Um, don't preach pride and prod. Um, we're not there to change people. We're there to connect with people and walk with them for a little while in their own process of change. Um, let that person dictate the speed at which they're willing to open up. Um, let that person dictate when they're ready to, uh, to seek out treatment for their addiction or psychiatric support for their mental illness. Um, don't, don't try to cram your agenda down people's throats. Um, that's a tricky balance because I think all of us are there because we want to help. We want to um, provide connection and referral and, and support for people, but that doesn't mean that we uh, strong arm people into something they're not ready for. Um, don't go at 4 a.m. I, mean, I think early morning outreach can be a good thing, but, but don't, um, don't wake people up to do it. Uh, you know, kind of time your outreach in a way that makes sense with the flow of your of what's going on in your community. And then finally, never give up. Uh, I think being a, an effective outreach worker takes incredible persistence and uh, consistency and just a dogged determination to, to be OK with whatever the outcome is and to just keep coming back and being there for people and being a consistent presence uh, on the streets and in camps and, and uh, you know in the places where other folks aren't. So I think being persistent um, I don't know how to say it other than saying be persistent in a very low-key way. And that, I think, um, has a profound impact on people. And they know you're there when they're ready. A couple of tips for staying safe. I said this a minute ago, but always let your supervisor know where you are. Go in pairs when possible. Um, if somebody's giving you signs that they don't want to be approached, don't approach them. I mean, you can come back another time. but. Um, Follow your gut instinct on that. Follow the, the hairs on the back of your neck. Um, and follow people's body language. If they're clearly letting you know that they don't want to be approached right now, don't approach them. Uh, no good is going to come of that at that moment. Um, don't interrupt the sale of drugs or sex. Trust your gut on that. Stay safe. Um, you know, I, I think introduce yourself and let people know what you're doing is a really good entree sometimes, and people will let you know how ready they are for a conversation. And just a couple of other things before I turn this back to Stephen um, for the next segment. Uh, our friend Ken Crabill, who we've talked about a couple of times in this call, um, who's a, a very experienced outreach worker in Seattle, Washington, talks about uh, three homes as a framework for ending homelessness. Now, a lot of times when we talk about ending homelessness, we get hung up on housing and support. And those are certainly vital components of ending homelessness. But homelessness is more than a loss of a house. And ending homelessness is more than a roof over people's heads. Uh, the three homes that Ken talks about are the self, the body, the person, the individual, and everything about them. Their heart, mind, body, soul, spirit. The second home is housing. It's, it's really the, the safe four walls that, that belongs to that person that has a roof over their head and a door to lock. And then the third home is about connection, it's community. It's this larger um, uh, kind of network web of, of people and connections and meaning that we find in our community. And 
SAMHSA talks about health, home, purpose, and community, uh, and, and really focusing on all three of these homes, not just the body and safety and, and not just the, the housing voucher that lets people go rent an apartment, but also human connection. I believe that all three of those uh, spaces that people inhabit are vital to address if we're talking about truly ending homelessness for people. Um, and and it's, you know, it's, it is more than just housing and case management. It is more than just health insurance that allows people to uh, treat their diabetes or, or get um, uh, their mental health care needs met. It really is about um, viewing a person as a whole uh, complicated, complex, beautiful member of society and trying to help that, that person find a path to meaning and, and reconnection with community, and reintegration in the fabric of community. Just very briefly, how we think about outreach is that it has evolved dramatically over the years. I think if you, if you talk with folks who were doing outreach um, during the, the spike in homelessness that we saw as a country in the early to mid-80s, it was really about engaging people. It was about providing for basic needs and engaging people so that hopefully they would come in at some point for services and support. We saw an evolution through the 1990s that focused more on not just referral, but actually providing uh, services for people on the street. And folks like Jim O'Connell in Boston and Jim Withers in Pittsburgh and many, many others around the country um, were, were in those days making a commitment to taking services to where people were and not just taking a bottle of water and a referral card, but also providing care and case management and medical support and all sorts of other things on the street. And I think we still see that happening. The shift that we've seen over the last decade is the connection that Stephen talked about earlier in the webinar on uh, thinking about housing-focused outreach. So uh, the direct line that can go between street outreach and Housing First, for example, permanent supportive housing, that has been a tremendous shift over the last decade, and I think a really exciting one that is embodied by folks like the 100,000 Homes Campaign, where they're out there on the street doing vulnerability indices to determine who is most likely uh, to die on the street, most medically fragile, and prioritize those folks for the, the limited housing resources that are available. That has been a huge shift in uh, policy and in practice over the last few years, and I think a really exciting one, and one that speaks directly to this notion of ending homelessness. And you know that shift does not come easily, and it does not come without a tremendous uh, cultivation of community collaboration that connects outreach, housing, and services. And if you already see that shift happening in your community, and I know it's happening in a lot of your communities, uh, continue it. Speed it along. Build those bridges uh, with housing programs and with, with uh, services and support programs, with health centers and community behavioral health programs. If you're in a community that you feel like has not yet hit that uh, shift in emphasis, I encourage you to be an advocate, to be a spearhead for changing the community that's saying, look, outreach is not just about keeping people alive while they're on the street. And we do that. But it's also about uh, becoming a, a direct pathway into permanent housing and ending homelessness for people once and for all. And I think that that's been a tremendous uh, evolution and one that we, we hope to see uh, continue to happen around the country. And Stephen, I think I'll turn it back to you to, to pick up on uh, kind of more strategies on rural and urban settings. Fantastic, Jeff. And it's always such a pleasure to listen to you. Um, it, it always inspires such um, hope and encouragement. So thank you. Um, there are some universal strategies for both rural and urban settings. Expand your eyes and ears. Make those connections. Inform others of your services. Stay in touch frequently. And when you're working the rural piece, remember that time and cost increase due to the distance of the travel, there's lower engagement numbers. I've talked about all of this already, but it, it is more difficult to find a contact if you lose them. Um, you don't want to exclude any potential connections. You're building relationships within the stores, with churches, police, and food pantries. You want to learn the official campgrounds, but you also want to try and know where the hidden camps are and potential camping areas that are within walking distance to safe water, 
to stores, to churches, to, to resources like camping supplies, like like places that like little uh, gas stations that serve hot food, you know, hot chicken or those darn big potato wedges or something. Uh, we talked about this earlier, but I think it bears repeating. Coordinate whenever possible with people you've discovered in rural areas. It'll help you find other people, and it'll bridge you quickly into other relationships. Again, this speaks to such an important aspect of why peers are so important to outreach. Now, urban outreach requires an understanding of the streets and the area, so let's explore that a little more thoroughly. Next slide. I'm going to address each one of these areas individually, I'll do it briefly, but I want to share some of the tips I've learned from my own experience. And um, This experience comes from both sides of the homelessness fence. Um, I've been a person experiencing homelessness and I've been a service provider. So let's start with food. Effective outreach workers really should be up to date on all the established and what I consider rolling street food services. They should work the lines of soup kitchens and day shelters on a regular basis and make a point of having a predictable schedule so that people who may want to engage you can always find you at some specific day and time in a certain location. With transportation, establish predictable walking routes on specified days and times. Use the routes of travel that many of the folks who are homeless use to move from one service to another. I target bus stops near day labor and plasma centers early in the morning, and I do it at quitting time on the day of, um, you know, like on the day shift uh, timeline. Um, you want to be consistent and predictable. A lot of eyes will be on you and they will watch you for consistency and perseverance. If you can't keep a regular schedule and be gently persistent in engaging the people you're coming across, how will you ever remain resolved to support those who have multiple challenges and barriers? Folks, folks see that. With restrooms, know the public restrooms available in your area. And also know the bathrooms that aren't friendly to the homeless, so you can provide that information as well. I try to target these, these restrooms that I know get used early in the morning because people bird bath in them, and they, they prep for, for either day labor or for going out to access services or just to kind of freshen up after a night out. Um, to talk to, you know, sleep on the streets and, and keep, a, keep an appearance. I incorporate these into your regular route of travel, and I, you know, it's just an important thing to be, again, persistent, consistent, um, and regular. Sleep cover. If you think it looks like a good place to get some sleep, the chances are that it's long been used, it's long been discovered, and probably police check it pretty frequently. Folks have to be extraordinarily creative due to the heightened efforts of law enforcement in many cities. And, and people may be right under your nose. You really need to check unlikely places for signs. And I look for things like pop-top lids, bugler or top tobacco packages, um, you know, flattened grass. I found a place that had broken branches in a hedge uh, that had a big hole in it, and people were sleeping in there. Um, if, if it seems so unlikely, um, that, that you would never go there, I would really encourage you to look there. And you also want to look up as well as down and under. More and more people are really kind of taken to sleeping on roofs and fire escapes. And um, if you notice when you're doing street outreach, uh, those of you who do it, um, it's rare that you look up. So I'm, I'm just telling you to, to kind of shift the way that you um, survey your surroundings. Know where folks go when inclement weather strikes libraries, public restrooms, the, the particular bridges or culverts, parks that have exhibit building, um, you know, places where people can get access. Uh, and on bad weather days, incorporate those locations into your travel route. Learn the signs and symptoms of acute illnesses common to people on the streets. Um, this helps you really make immediate medical referrals, and it helps you assess, I think, a little more thoroughly what's going on with your, with your individual. Learn the symptoms of the most prevalent uh, mental illnesses and request some training to more effectively deal with people experiencing mental health or addiction issues. Raise awareness within your community about the dangers people face when homeless and advocate, advocate, advocate to end homelessness. Form relations with empathetic police officers in your area. They are often the first to find folks on the street and your relationship with them could mean the difference between an arrest and a referral to you for services. Next slide. 
Now, in many of the trainings I do related to outreach, I often ask people to tell me what the purpose of outreach is. And believe me, I get all kinds of answers, almost all of them good. But it is really rare that people ever tell me that the purpose of outreach is to put people into housing and end homelessness for them. The connection between outreach and housing is developing a clear, easy to navigate path for a person living without a home to follow so that together with you, they end their journey in housing. Remember, the purpose of outreach is to help someone meet their basic needs build trust and rapport with individuals who do not access traditional services, and connect people with housing, services, and supports. It's really easy to get caught up kind of in that minutia of the day, um, especially as an outreach specialist, and you lose sight of the bigger picture, the ultimate goal, which is to end homelessness. Good outreach specialists never lose sight of the prize, and they keep hope alive for those who long ago may have just given up that they'd ever get housing again. Next slide, please. The truth is, we now know without a doubt that housing and services make a difference. Over 80% of supporting housing tenants are able to maintain housing for at least 12 months. Most supportive housing tenants engage in services even when that participation is not a condition of tenancy. That is a big, big number, uh, or a big deal, excuse me. The use of costly and restrictive service declines in homeless, homeless services, health care, and criminal justice systems. Next slide. We also know that nearly any combination of housing and services is more effective than just services alone. And we know that housing first models with adequate support services can be effective for people who don't meet the conventional criteria, criteria for housing readiness. Next slide. In the end, I want you to remember two things. We're here to help end homelessness. And to do that, the relationship with our brothers and sisters on the street matters. And it matters a lot. So you want to be curious, you want to seek to understand, and you want to be tolerant of what you don't understand. Practice those reflective listening skills. Jeff talked earlier about motivational inter interviewing. And I, I can tell you, it, it, it changed my life both as a person who received it from a counselor and as a person who has used it uh, in my outreach and, and really in my life in general. You need to suspend judgment. It's not, impossible, it's not possible to completely get rid of all judgments, but you definitely can suspend them. And remember that you're catching just a snapshot of the person that you're working with. It's just one moment in time in the life of a human being. And you can't really you, you can't lose sight of that. Avoid negatives like can't, don't, or won't. We need to inspire hope and we need to inspire trust by never promising what we can't deliver and by being transparent and honest with everyone that we work with. We need to avo avoid confrontation. And, and again, this, this working collaborative, collaboratively with others, it's just so important. I don't care what a person's inner motivation for any homelessness is. I just care that they want to end homelessness as bad as I do. Be reliable. Your word is your bond, and it will make or break your street cred in the blink of an eye. It's important to be concise and concrete. And most of all, you've got to be willing to acknowledge your own errors, your own mistakes, and fail forward so that you normalize the fact that people can make mistakes and that it's OK. The key is to do it better the next time. Next slide. So I want to thank all of you for allowing me to share with you today. And I leave you with a quote that has inspired me since the very first outreach training I attended when it was shared with me. It really has become how I see my life and my recovery and how I see my purpose in the world today. And I hope it inspires you in some small way too. We have been called to heal wounds, to unite what has fallen, and to bring home those who have lost their way. Thank you again. And I'll turn this back over to Jeff for his closing comment. Stephen, thank you. Uh, I just want to share with you a few of the kind of references that we've talked about and some resources that are available just for a minute or so, and then we'll go into a question and answer period. So I encourage you to um, get your questions ready and submit those, and we'll just have a conversation here in a minute. Um, this set of slides, as I understand it, will be available, so you'll have this reference list. I just want to call out a couple of these. One, um, the report that Ellen Bassett wrote in 1994 
uh, around community care for people who've been homeless and had mental illness, uh, addiction, or dual diagnosis, um, really started to begin to coalesce the uh, understanding of outreach as uh, did the Bobby Mowbray article that's just a couple below that. In 1999, Erickson and Page published an article called To Dance with Grace that is still, almost 15 years later, just a, a fantastic um, snapshot of outreach and engagement. And that was presented at the 1998 National Symposium on Homelessness Research and is still, I think, one of the best uh, outreach articles that's ever been written. Um, the, the Kim Crayville curriculum that you've heard Stephen and myself reference over the last hour was published by the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council, and it's the best outreach curriculum around. It's really still fantastic. It's got a, um, a kind of healthcare bent to it because of the HCH uh, Council's um, mission in the world, but I think a lot of it is, is applicable to certainly PATH providers and to any of the rest of you doing outreach in these settings. In 2009, a group of us um, with SAMHSA support did a review of the literature uh, on outreach and engagement, and that's the Olivet et al. article from 2009. Um, that's free and available on the Homelessness Resource Center website and at the Open Health Services and Policy Journal. And then there are a number of other articles listed there that are the more, I think, academic backbone of what is known about, uh, about outreach. Uh, the PATH program itself has a number of very good resources uh, on the SAMHSA website, uh, including uh, a set of outreach videos that are available on YouTube. That's the fourth bullet that you see down the list there. Those were designed to be training videos for both new and experienced outreach workers on how to do their work well. Um, and then there, again, there's a link to the, uh, the Healthcare for the Homeless curriculum there at the bottom. So those are all resources that will be available to you uh, in the slides as they come out. So I, I know uh, you're probably you know, frantically trying to scribble down those URLs. Um, those will, will be made available, and there are a lot of um, a lot of training and support resources available uh, through SAMHSA. And I think with that, I'll turn it back to Rachel to lead the question and answer session. And uh, Steve and I are are here and available for the next few minutes to uh, field questions as they come. Great, thank you very much, Jeff. Um, so we now have some time for questions. And if you'd like to submit a question, you can type your question in the chat box, which I believe is on the right-hand corner of your screen. And we're going to do our best to answer all questions in the remaining time. Um, but we only have a few so far. So if you have a burning question, please uh, send it along, and we'll do our best to get through it. So the first question we have here says, does SAMHSA have guidelines on how much in-reach versus outreach should be done by a PATH homeless program? I've heard that there's a guideline, but I've not been able to find it written anywhere. Um, I think, Tisu, maybe that's a good question for you. So Rachel, let me understand the question. So they're asking for uh, some guidelines, or whether we have any guidelines on our website? Yes, they're asking. They're, they're, it sounds like they. They're asking if SAMHSA has like anything specific that says how much outreach versus inreach should happen, or if it's up to the up to the state or up to the program. Right. Uh, right now, uh, you know, based upon um, um, if if a provider is looking for how much outreach they have to do or versus inreach, it's up to the state path contact. So if the state path contact has some restrictions or some guidelines as to how much of uh, inreach or outreach. Uh, that is up to the state path conduct. SAMHSA usually don't have that kind of a guideline for the, you know, for the providers. So it is basically up to the state path conduct to decide. Um, so we don't have any guideline on our on our on our website, or we haven't issued any of those at this point. And this is Jeff. If I could just piggyback on that, I think there has been a shift nationally. Uh, towards a greater emphasis on outreach versus inreach. And I think that's important to pay attention to. And again, if you're in a community that's already doing that, more power to you. If you're in a community where, or an agency where most of your outreach is, is what we defined earlier as inreach, uh, meaning uh, outreach to a shelter, for example, or a meal site, or you know, a service setting of some kind, I would encourage you to challenge that in your own mind and in your own agency and in your own community. 
to sort of think about how to reach the most vulnerable. Um, there's been a shift in emphasis as well within HUD um, recently where there's more focus on reaching the most vulnerable and prioritizing them for, for housing. And so I think, uh, you know, whether you're a PATH provider or, or any kind of outreach program, um, get out there on the margins of where people are. I, mean, I think that's the, the principle. Don't just wait for them to come in for a meal or in for a shelter night uh, or in for a, a health care appointment. Um, get teams out there on the street. I think that's often where the biggest uh, need is. It's the people who are most at, at risk. They're the, the folks who have been most marginalized uh, by society, the folks who have really slipped through the cracks of our existing systems. And Jeff, this is Stephen, and I would just add to that, um, you know, a lot of the folks who are actually out there and who don't come into services um, really aren't exposed to any of the information that often circulates through like a soup kitchen or a day shelter or a, a, a transitional housing project. Um, so part of how I see that, that outreach piece is that I, I am the deliverer of additional information, information that um, many people can access, but if, if you never are in front of the messenger, um, you'll never get the message. Great. Thank you all. Um, so another question we have here says, HUD recently asked communities to prioritize the most vulnerable people and ensuring that they're housed. How does that affect outreach? Sounds very similar to what you all were speaking to. Do you have more to add? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, you know, certainly the housing resources are driven by HUD. Uh, you know, some cities and counties and states kick in a little bit. Sometimes there are um, you know other local efforts, but but the vast majority of, of permanent housing uh, that really contributes to the ending of homelessness in this country is driven by HUD dollars and HUD uh, policy. And I think this the the shift. Um, towards more vulnerable folks that, that I think is really demonstrated by a wider acceptance of a housing first um, philosophy and, and approach and more permanent um, housing models as opposed to some of the transitional focus of a decade ago. Um, that's a real indicator. I think it's a real indicator of federal policy broadly. Um, but I, I also believe deeply that it's the right thing to do. I mean, it, we've got limited resources. Let's go reach the folks who are most vulnerable and and uh, make sure that they uh, have you know very ready access into the the resources that do exist, both in terms of housing and services. Okay, yeah, thank you both. All right, so another question here says that you mentioned to avoid case management activity. What activity specifically are you referring to? Rachel, this is Stephen, and, and um, often what I've experienced um, is that, you know, we, we have a large base of, of folks who we serve as outreach workers, um, and in the referral process, we are often, um, we, we want to get things accomplished quickly, and there's a, there is a balance between doing a warm handoff to somebody who can help uh, an individual obtain uh, a birth certificate, just as an example, or uh, maybe obtain some ID, um, versus the outreach worker just kind of, you know, walking alongside somebody and doing those things um, to, to expedite the whole process. And the challenge there is the, the more time you are spending with um, individuals doing work that frankly, others can do for you um, as long as you're you know, following up and, and kind of keeping tabs to make sure that it gets done. Uh, that's, that's uh, the, the, it takes away from the time that you're able to spend on the street actually meeting people and building some relationships. So when I talk about that, that blur into case management, um, that's really what I'm referring to. It, it, and each, each organization it, it comes at this a little differently. 
Um, so it's important to understand how your organization really defines what the role the case manager will play versus the role that the, the street outreach specialist will play. And and I'm you know definitely a realist. I recognize that in this time of scarce resources, often um, we are the outreach worker and we are the case manager. So I, I recognize that that this can be a challenge. But I just I, I guess I reiterate that. Outreach is developing those relationships, uh, building those trusting uh, partnerships, and walking alongside somebody, alongside somebody in their journey to, you know, reach kind of that ultimate goal, which is you know the services and some housing. Um, and the more that we can facilitate that uh, by, uh, you know, handing people off to the appropriate. Um, resources that, that are really effective in doing that, I think the better we serve our, our base. I think that's a great answer, Stephen, and I'd just like to add a couple of things to it. One, during the 10 years or so that I was a street outreach worker, I was also a case manager. And to me, one way to think about this is it's a mindset shift that, um, the, you know, a case manager is often, I, mean, you're, I think you're a lot of things, you wear a lot of hats, but you're often a bulldozer to obstacles in the person's way, right? You're, you know, you're kind of accompanying people to food stamp appointments and being an advocate. You're making good referrals for a whole range of things, some very complicated, some very straightforward. Um, you're certainly connecting with people and, and kind of walking beside them in the way that I talked about with outreach. But you're in a very different mindset when somebody walks into your clinic or um, case management program or ACT team or you know whatever you, whatever setting you're in and they, and they walk in saying okay I'm you know I'm, I'm ready let's go here are the things I want to do I need your help uh, and then you're you know you're in a sort of service planning mode perhaps and in a referral and breaking down barriers kind of mode that's very different than what happens in a first time encounter on outreach where you're not in problem solving mode yet you're not in advocacy mode yet it's all about the connection and the relationship so I think part of it's just understanding that the pace of outreach can vary dramatically, and we don't set it. The person does. You know, we don't say, "Okay, here's what I want to accomplish today," because that person may not be in that space today, even if they seemed like it a week ago, or they may really surprise you and say, "Hey, I need your help doing X, Y, and Z. Let's go." And, and it, you know, there may be times where we very much shift into kind of more case manager mode, even on a street corner. I mean, certainly I've done that. Um, but I, I think, in my mind, the, the process that, that happens in outreach and engagement is very different than the process that happens in case management and advocacy, even if it's the same person doing it. Uh, it's it's a, like a different hat you put on. And so the next question here says, can you talk a little bit about the importance of working with people's goals and share some strategies used for supporting transitions. Sorry, Rachel, could you repeat that? I, I sort of missed the first part of it. Oh, sure. I'm sorry. It says, can you talk a little bit about the importance of working with people's goals and share some strategies used for supporting transitions? Stephen, you want to take a stab at that, or you want me to? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, I think it, it, from the outreach perspective, I'm, I'm looking to build enough of a trusting relationship that folks will even share their goals. I mean, I think I would be kind of reluctant to, um, in, a, in, in a, an engagement session, um, in, a, in sort of a trust building session, um, start trying to identify goals right away. Um, I think for me, it, it's uh, listening for what I think might be goals, and then reflecting those goals or those those possibilities back at people, um, and and then supporting them through whatever steps it might take to get through that transition. So if somebody says, you know, my goal is to um, find find some employment and be able to end this you know end this homelessness. Then uh, I think for me as an outreach worker, I'm going to start looking at where in my network of resources I actually have people who can do that for me. Um, my I think my I see myself as 
being the person who stands alongside that individual, makes the introduction, does a warm handoff in a supportive way, makes sure that the people that, that my client is going to um, are going to be treated with dignity and respect. Um, I'm going to follow up. I'm going to support that individual if there's challenges there. Um, but I think, honestly, the way I see it, I'm, I'm just a, a kind of a, a, a reflection of what their, what their hopes and dreams are going to be and what their, what their goals are going to be. That's going to come through that, that process of relationship building. Jeff, do you want to add? I think that's a really nice way to think about it. That it, you know, there, there's a way to let goals, let someone's goals and priorities unfold more naturally, uh, as opposed to pushing it at a tempo that, that they're not quite ready for. And it is um, on the heels of the relationship and the trust. But you know, I, I believe so deeply that people they change when they're ready to change. They access services and housing when they're ready to access services and housing, and we can influence that. Uh, mindset and motivation, but we can't dictate it. And I think Stephen's absolutely right that you build relationships and build trust and build rapport, and then people will let you know very clearly what their priorities are, what their goals are. I also think there's a way to have a conversation about goals that is that doesn't sound like treatment, um, that doesn't sound like service planning, that sounds like a conversation about the future, that sounds like a conversation about hope, um, and and this that's more like a natural conversation as opposed to I'm the service provider and you're the client and we're going to map out action steps for the next month. I mean, that's, that, that's slightly off-putting to someone who's been pretty um, disconnected from institutions and programs and, and that sort of thing. Around the question of transitions, transitions are hard. They just are. And no matter what the transition is, even from street to home, transitions are hard. Um, our organization moved into a new office space, like a larger space, last Friday. And I got to tell you, people came into work this morning and they just looked confused as hell. They had no idea where their things were, where to go, what to do, and you know they're excited about it, but it's hard. Um, I, I dropped my six-year-old girl off at first grade this morning, and she was very tearful. We just had a wonderful weekend, and she gets back to school. It's the second, you know, third week of first grade. And that transition moment is a hard one. Now, compound that uh, in life of someone who has experienced tremendous rejection, loss, trauma, pain, um, you know, has mistrust for everyone in his or her life, and assume we're going to walk in that door and five minutes later they're going to be fine with us and follow us wherever we might want to take them. It just doesn't happen that way. And so I think there has to be tremendous patience with the process of exiting homelessness, of accessing care, of moving into a, a supportive housing program, any of it. Um, even if the outcome is obviously better than the living situation someone's in now, transition is hard. It just is. And I think we've got to recognize that and, and respond to it and prepare for it. I mean, it, 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 I, I used to run a, a supportive housing program, and I can't tell you how many people who had maybe six months of sobriety coming into the program relapsed the first weekend in their own place. And it had to do with transition being hard. It had to do with all of a sudden your social support network is gone and you find yourself alone. And even though you've got a roof over your head, it's not all sweetness and light. And so I think being very realistic about how hard those transitions are, how, how patient we need to be in supporting people through transition, and how ambivalent people are about their own goals, um, I, I think are all just important factors to keep in mind. And as much as I told you not to preach, prod, and cry earlier, I feel like I'm doing that right now, so I'm going to stop talking. But Jeff, I think you're, you're dead on around the support piece of that, where, I mean, I see myself all the time, when, especially when I'm watching people move from um, real kind of straight street life into either even something as simple as, as um, a soup kitchen, but really from street to housing, my job as an outreach specialist is really to be there to make the connection that there's another human being who recognizes 
this is very difficult, um, that I am there to support that person through that process, whatever that support might look like. It may mean that I'm traveling with this individual back to a camp to spend some time with people that were part of his network and his community before he, he entered housing. And all of those things, those transition zones, um, I think, and I think about this in my own recovery and my kind of my own exit from homelessness. Um, it took time to build my own network, and if it wasn't for people who were who cared enough to be there when I needed them, um, I, I don't know that I would have made it. And that, that's really the honest truth. So, from that outreach perspective, um, supporting people through those transitions might be better than trying to work them into the transition themselves. Thank you both. So I've got one last question here, I think, um, before we wrap it up. And it says, other than just keep plugging away, what are some of the steps that work in breaking down the silo mentality and developing a team approach? I'll read it one more time. Go ahead. You can go ahead and read it again, Stephen. I don't know if you want to. Yeah, yeah I think this is a yeah. great question to end with. Um, it says, other than just keep plugging away, what are some of the steps that work in breaking down the silo mentality and developing a team approach? Well, it, Rachel, this is Stephen. One, uh, one of the things I think is really important is being willing to step outside of the silo, um, and and that's that's challenging. Uh, people people get um, familiar with with what's in their organization or their you know their their little um, corner of of their their field or what they're doing, um, and it's familiar. And when you have to reach across the table and collaborate with other people, you you kind of enter unfamiliar territory. Um, and so we always gravitate to what's familiar versus, you know, taking the risk of things that are unfamiliar. So it's it, the first piece for me is being able to step outside of my my silo, my organization, my routine, and start really kind of objectively looking and and having conversations with people who might be pitching some different ideas. Um, the other thing that I think helped a lot here in my community, uh, we have um, a number of meetings that. Um, each organization puts on, and, and um, several years ago we decided that maybe it would be better if all of the organizations got together in a monthly, what we call a GAPS meeting. And that GAPS meeting brings all of the service delivery organizations together once a month in the morning, um, and we talk about where we are finding challenges. And in the in the, the little bit of time, really, that we, I think, honestly, if you think about this in a continuum, um, it, it, what we've learned from the time that we've been together um, has really changed the way that we we develop teams to uh, address some of the challenges here. Um, I talked a little bit earlier about the 100,000 Homes campaign that came in uh, and, and um, helped us with the, the House National campaign this year, and um, that team uh, brought that team was generated from that GAPS meeting because we recognized that. We were duplicating services, we were missing people, and we really weren't very effective in putting people into housing. Not only that, but we didn't have the right people at the table, uh, and we didn't really know people who could access the, the right people to get them to the table. So when we began to um, gather, um, we, we really kind of um, capitalized on the connections that were in that room. Now, nobody in my organization would have been able to pull that off by themselves. It took a group of us to get everybody that needed to be at the table together, and we never would have got there had we not been talking previously about why we weren't able to do it in the first place. Now, Jeff, I don't know if you've got anything to add. I think that's a great answer, and I think we're just about at time here, Rachel. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jeff and Stephen, so much, and thank everyone for your questions. And um, so this concludes our Q and A session, and I'm going to just turn it over to Stephen now for some final remarks. Um, Peter. 
Thank you, Rachel, for uh, facilitating this seminar, and thank you. And I want to take this opportunity to thank our knowledgeable speakers, uh, Jeff Olivet and uh, Steve Samara, uh, for this very informative session. I also want to thank the many participants that joined us today. It's uh, your work that is making a re real difference in the lives of so many. I hope today's webinar makes some uh, small difference for you that you learn something you are going to try or were intrigued, intrigued by something you want to explore. This concludes our webinar and we look forward to our ongoing work together. Have a great afternoon. Rachel? Thanks, Jitin. Um, also, just to note, you will all be receiving a satisfaction questionnaire via email after this call. Um, so please fill that out with your thoughts on, um, on the webinar today. And then uh, the presentation will be emailed to email to everyone. It will also be available online, but I don't have the exact link right now, so we're going to email it to you all so you don't have to dig for it. Um, so thank you to all of our participants and speakers today. Today's webinar has ended, and all participants may disconnect at this time. Thank you very much.